Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our first of many Link and Learn webinars, Putting PrEP into Practice, PrEP as an HIV Prevention. This webinar is presented today by Health HIV and, and Whitman Walker Health, facilitated by um, Megan Komen and Justin Arnold. I'm Carmelita Whitfield, Program Manager with Health HIV and lead for the Workforce Capacity Building Initiative. I'm joined today by my colleague, Mr. Christopher Cannon, and PrEP facilitators, Megan Coleman and Justin Arnold. I wanted to just give you a brief overview of Health HIV. Um, we have four core capacities, capacity building, advocacy, education and training, and resources, research and evaluation. We are located in Washington, D.C. and have a diverse staff of professionals with expertise in HIV, HCV, LGBT health, clinical, global, and cultural competencies for, and prevention. In addition, Health HIV has numerous strategic partners, both local and national, in clinical, behavioral, political, and technological, technological capacities. Within our core, I'm sorry, within our core capabilities, we offer eight CEWA programs, and I encourage you all to please visit our website at www.healthhiv.org. Today's webinar is presented and provided to you under the category of workforce capacity building. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to my colleague, Christopher King. Thank you, Carmelita. Uh, I would like to just take one brief moment and share that Health HIV has an initiative of the National Coalition for LGBT Health. And our membership is comprised of state and national LGBT organizations, state and local health departments, health centers, academic programs, universities, and the LGBT individuals and consumers. Um, if the, more information about our program is online, and you can visit our website at www.healthlgbt.org. At this time, I am going to take a moment to welcome Megan Coleman from Whitman Walker Health and her colleague, Justin Arnold, who will be presenting today on PrEP for health, HIV prevention. Megan? Hi, all. Thank you so much for having Justin and myself here today. We're really excited to talk about PrEP and HIV prevention and how um, we built it into our program here at Whitman Walker. So I'm a nurse practitioner, and I, both Justin and I work at Whitman Walker, where he is the interim director of our sexual health and wellness clinic and also a primary care physician assistant who sees both HIV positive and HIV negative individuals. And we currently provide PrEP at our site in DC to over 350 individuals, and we've integrated it into our program. Um, I don't know what that is. There are more slides. Okay, so <laughs> sorry. Um, I think uh, that these are other modules. Those were available. those were my slides. <laughs> I am very sorry for that. There you go. That's okay. We'll try again. Um, and I think there is a question that people may not be able to hear me. Robin? I don't know whether I should continue or pause for a moment. One second, Megan.
Megan, go ahead and continue. Okay. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for being patient. Everyone will be able to hear me. So let's dive into this prep conversation. So PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis is just part of the growing spectrum of HIV prevention methods available. It works best in collaboration with other methods, and no one is the same, so not one method of prevention is going to work for everyone. So it's going to be really important to have an honest and frank conversation with your patients, with your clients, um, and move on from there. So what exactly is PrEP? So PrEP is a really basic idea. It's taking a medication to treat, that's used to treat HIV to prevent individuals at high risk of HIV from becoming infected. <coughs> it is a new application of an old idea. It's things that we do all the time in, in, our, private in our primary practice. So for example, we take birth control before becoming pregnant to prevent pregnancy. People take anti-malarial medication before traveling to places where the risk of contracting malaria is high. And then people take HIV medications before they are exposed to the virus to prevent infection. So PrEP is not alone as a biomedical prevention method. We use HIV medications to prevent HIV in a few different ways, which are listed here. Um, all of them have their advantages and their disadvantages. So for example, we do pre-exposure prophylaxis, or daily dosing to prevent HIV, post-exposure prophylaxis, which is within three days of a potential HIV exposure, pa patients take 28 days of medication. It reduces the chance that HIV will spread throughout the body. And then HIV individuals taking antiretrovirals to prevent HIV transmission to others. So three different methods in which we use this biomedical form of prevention. We're going to talk primarily about PrEP today, and so we're going to dive in a little bit more about the idea behind PrEP. So what is it exactly? There is only one medication available for pre-exposure prophylaxis in the United States, and that is Truvada. It was approved by, for PrEP by the FDA in 2012 and recommended by the CDC for people at substantial risk in 2014. And then recently, the WHO came out and recommended it for everyone at substantial risk for HIV. The pill is taken once a day, every day. And it's the only medication that's currently approved. However, like I tell my patients and I tell other providers prescribing PrEP, PrEP of 2015 is not necessarily the PrEP of 2020 or the future. Research is ongoing in other, for different delivery systems, different medications, different formularies. It's a very exciting area, this idea of biomedical HIV prevention. So the first four studies listed here, the IPREX, the Partners PrEP, um, TDF2, and the Bangkok Tenofovir study were all pivotal to the approval of Truvada for PrEP in 2012 in the United States. What we've discovered is that Truvada's efficacy for HIV prevention is closely tied to adherence. So the last two studies on this, as you can see, the FEM PrEP and the VOICE studies, had very, very low levels of adherence, and there was no statistical, statistical efficacy found. However, the Partners PrEP study had a high level of adherence, and when you extrapolate out patients who were taking the medication as prescribed, they found that adherence and efficacy were very closely linked. The other two studies listed on this are the UK's PROUD study and the French IPERGAY study, and those results were released last year. They both showed a high level of HIV risk reduction, and both studies were actually cut short and, op and, op and became open label because they're regulatory boards found it found them at such high levels of efficacy that everyone should be allowed the option for PrEP. We'll go more in a little bit detail on the different dosing strategy of the Ipergay study in a couple slides. So we know that PrEP, when taken every day, can protect against HIV infection. But daily oral PrEP does not. It does not get, guarantee 100% against HIV. It does not protect against STIs. It does not prevent pregnancy. It is not a cure for HIV. It is not a vaccine for HIV. And it does not function as a standalone treatment for individuals living with HIV disease. And like I mentioned before, it's only one component of an HIV prevention strategy. Since it's only one part of HIV prevention, how does it compare to other strategies? For example, in a patient with detectable drug levels in their blood, it is extremely protective. Both the IPREX and the Partners PrEP study found over a 90% reduction in HIV transmission. 
The other biomedical prevention listed here, the treatment is prevention. So that's taking, when the HIV positive individual is taking medications to prevent viral load, <coughs> excuse me, to increase viral suppression. And that was the HPTN 052 study also showed a high reduction in HIV transmission rates. In comparison, a study of condoms in US MSM found a 70% reduction in HIV transmission, and, and an STD treatment is a 42% reduction. So no method is perfect, and like I said before, PrEP is only part of a prevention option open to individuals. When you look a little closer at Truvada for PrEP's effectiveness, we discussed that it's linked with dosing and adherence, so it seems to depend on the tissues that potentially come in contact with HIV infection. For example, those who engage in anal intercourse have in anal intercourse only seem to have more forgiveness with daily dosing than those engaged in vaginal intercourse. It seems vaginal intercourse and cervical tissues take about six to seven doses per week to offer a 94% risk reduction, while four doses per week seem to offer the same risk reduction in those involved in rectal intercourse only. What other factors could contribute to the forgiveness of daily Truvada? Um, it takes about seven days to reach protected levels for rectal intercourse, and after that seven days, Truvada has a some, somewhat hot, long half-life, and the drugs can stay in their body for a longer time, leading to forgiveness of missed doses, and then a higher likelihood of preventing HIV infection. But if you remember before, there were some variable results, and there was some difference in, um, in tissue uptake or concentration with women. And so what, why are such variable results with women? So the two, one study, the Partners PrEP and the TDF2, showed a significant reduction in HIV risk in those both involved women. The other two studies, Fem PrEP and VOICE, showed no effect on HIV risk. And the primary driver that showed the different results was suboptimal adherence. And like we said before, though, tenofovir reaches lower concentrations in the vagical and cervical tissues than rectal tissues. So adherence may be even more important for PrEP efficacy among women engaged in vaginal sex. But this all goes to show that there needs to be more research into PrEP for women to address these questions, and a need to involve women in, in, in prevention research from the start. That was just a little background on PrEP, and this is going to go into a little bit more detail on more recent research studies that have been released over the last year or so. I had mentioned IPRGA just briefly before, and IPRGA is a 400-person study involving MSM who engaged in frequent sex in France and Canada. And this study was different from the other studies in that it was placebo-controlled, so half of the population was receiving a placebo and half was getting dosed according to the schedule. And what it was is it's event-based dosing. So individuals two to 24 hours before a sexual encounter would take two pills, and then they would have sexual intercourse, and then they receive another dose of Truvada the day after, and then another dose 48 hours after, 48 hours after sex. The studies show that there was a relative risk reduction by 86%. However, in this study, as I mentioned, people were having frequent sex. So participants were averaging about two sexual acts per week and taking about four doses per week and this was involved in, in, in rectal intercourse, and so they were achieving doses that may have been protective on their own of just dosing four doses per week, as we discussed earlier. So we really need to know more about whether on-demand dosing would protect MSM who have sex less frequently and therefore take PrEP less often. The study is continuing open label, so more studies, more answers should be available soon. Another study that got released recently is the ADAPT study, and this is looking at feasibility and acceptability of different dosing regimens. So it looked at three different dosing regimens, and, what it, and while it did not look at efficacy or whether or not anyone worked better than the other, it looked at whether a non-daily dosing regimen would have better adherence and coverage of sex acts. And this offered some interesting findings. So the three dosing regimens were once a day, every day, twice a week with the post-sex dose, and then event-driven was the third one, which is one, two to 24 hours before and one after sex, or the 24 hours after sex. And the three sites were involved were Bangkok, Harlem, and Cape Town, and they were chosen for their different patient populations. So in Bangkok, the primary um, study participant was an IV drug user. In Harlem, the primary study participant was a 
African American MSM, and in Cape Town, the primary study participant was a woman. Was a <coughs> excuse me, was a woman, and they found that in Harlem and Cape Town, as participants went from daily dosing to having non-daily dosing regimens, they were having a harder time being adherent or taking the doses prescribed. And so what they saw was that perhaps one dosing regimen may not work for everybody. And I'll go through our key takeaway points in the next one. So they found that the adherence was higher at daily regimens in all three locations. They hypothesized that perhaps habits were formed around daily pill taking, that the missed doses were most often were pills meant for after sex, so the event so the twice weekly and the event driven regimens. So non-daily prep may be a good option for men who have sex with sex less often, but who know in advance where it may happen, but we don't know how often people have to take that because that wasn't an, a, a trial to prove efficacy. So overall, we need to learn more about PrEP and how to offer it, and regimens should be adaptable to fit the unique circumstances of individuals' lives. The other study that came out recently with more information about daily dosing and dosing that is needed for, um, for coverage for HIV risk reduction. It's the IPREX OLA was the open label extension study of the original IPREX study. And this study enrolled um, MSM and trans females. And so what they found was looking at drug levels in people's blood samples, that it seemed to be about four to six doses per week offered near 100%, um, about 96% effectiveness. And that was pretty much the same between four and six doses and up to seven doses. So what they found was that 100% adherence to oral PrEP not needed for full benefit for those involved in rectal intercourse. Another study that was done this year was the PrEP demonstration project. And so how does adherence and PrEP delivery translate from a structured research setting, such as the IPREX study or the IPREX LA, into clinical practice? This is the PrEP demonstration project was the first demonstration project in the United States that had results. And that was at San Francisco, Miami, in our site in DC. And this is where we start learning about demonstration implementation and how they work in the real life. So the study showed that overall there was a high adherence on the study based on drug levels, so over 80%, and that 63% of individuals had protected drug levels at all visits throughout the year, throughout the year-long study. About 15% of individuals had a PrEP disruption or stopped taking PrEP for some part of the year, and this was most commonly due to side, side effect concerns or a low perceived risk. When we looked at who took the, the drugs more consistently based on behavioral surveys and questionnaires, they found that individuals at higher risk use PrEP more consistently, which was an interesting finding. So having condomless sex was associated with better adherence. The other area that people talk to me a lot about or we have a lot of discussions about is this idea of risk compensation. So if participants or if patients take PrEP, there'll be less condom use. And with less condom use, they'll have higher rates of sexual intercourse. And then they would have higher rates of STDs, higher rates of, um, higher rates of STDs, higher rates of pregnancy for um, heterosexual couples. So what they found in IPREX and PROUD study is that there was no statistical significance or difference between placebo and oral Truvada in subjects reporting condomless receptive anal intercourse. And the PrEP demonstration project also showed no increase from baseline in condomless sex or in the rate of STIs. So it's a concern that we've had, and it was a, it's a concern that a lot of people talk about. We just haven't seen it in research studies. So why is that? And what facilitates safe behavior during PrEP use? And how do we get this idea of safe behavior? So participants taking Dela Truvada report a less denial of HIV. There's less anxiety. The pill serves as a daily reminder of the imminent threat of HIV. There are risk mitigation strategies throughout that, calm, that, that can calm moments of many days. There are acceptable solutions to the threat of HIV. We also see social support, so regular consistent contact with testing, counseling, and peers, and acceptance of social and sexual goals. So as we said, being on PrEP does not appear to lead people engaging in risky or sexual behaviors, so sexual risk compensation. The side effects are usually mild and usually temporary. 
usually they are in the first weeks of treatment and go away by, the, by 12 weeks of treatment. Most common, we see nausea, cramping, unintended weight loss. Um, they quickly subside. They can help if taken with food. Other observed side effects we see is that there may be an, a 1% average decrease in bone mineral density. It levels off over time and doesn't progress and usually doesn't warrant treatment on study. And one in 200 people experience kidney problems. It resolves after stopping the medication. And at least in the PrEP demonstration project and a couple other studies, everyone has been able to restart after temporarily starting the medication. I'm going to move on to considerations for PrEP use. And this will be more talking about how we implemented PrEP and how to prescribe PrEP in a clinical setting. So who is a good candidate for PrEP? Men or women, regardless of sexual orientation, in an ongoing sexual relationship with a partner who has HIV, so serodiscordant couples. This can be particularly if a person is trying to conceive. The reason for that is that we have a, a relationship where we know there is frequent condomless intercourse with the atten intention of pregnancy. Um, that doesn't mean that women are only eligible or good candidates for PrEP if they're looking to become pregnant. MSM, heterosexual men or heterosexual women who engage in condomless sex with individuals with unknown HIV status who are at high risk of HIV infection. This is probably going to be the majority of people that you work with. And people who inject illicit drugs or share injection equipment. This slide is an interesting slide. And it actually goes into a little more about what does PrEP uptake look like in a primary care setting. And this is when Kaiser and San Francisco looked at its PrEP data and showed that there was an increased uptake in PrEP usage over the last year and a half. And they, they started to look into who was using it, how was it being utilized, and how it fit into their system. And what they did was found that no new cases of HIV was reported among individuals on PrEP, despite high rates of STIs and self-reported decrease in condom use among the 41% of PrEP users. So this was a, a real-life study, that, or real-life interpretation of data that seemed to imply that people were using condoms less, STI rates were holding stable, and there were no new, no new infections on, on what people were taking Truvada. So that was over 1,000 people were referred for their PrEP program, and 677 people started PrEP during that year and a half. We saw similar kind of uptake at Whitman Walker, where we started off with about 20 people in our PrEP program at 2012. In 2013, we had about 80 people in our PrEP program, and now we're averaging about 35 to 40 new PrEP patients a month. My colleague, Al Lu, created a PrEP cascade, which is how to, trying to identify how to integrate PrEP into their clinical setting. So Al Lu is from Bridge HIV in San Francisco, and he prevented this cascade from both the patient's and provider's viewpoints. And PrEP success really requires both sides. So for example, a patient may identify themselves at risk for HIV infection, identify themselves as a PrEP candidate, may be interested in PrEP and seek out care. They are linked into a PrEP program, initiate PrEP, retain in a PrEP program, and achieve and maintain medication adherence. From the provider side point, we have to provide health, they provide health care to at-risk populations. They get educated about PrEP. They're willing to provide PrEP, link to a PrEP program, initiate PrEP, retain in a PrEP program. And it's really I found both the patients and providers that are working together to educate each other about PrEP, be aware of other HIV prevention options. So how do we do that? How do we go from this idea of what PrEP is and then integrate it into our clinical practice? So we're going to go through in a little bit of detail, but we're going to identify patients, prescribe PrEP and adherence support. There's ongoing monitoring of PrEP, discontinuing of PrEP, and patient support. I will say that PrEP is perhaps the easiest thing I do in my clinical care. Um, it's great. It's a lot of open space communication and talking. It's an opportunity to engage people in the healthcare that may not necessarily be engaged in healthcare. It's opportunities to talk about other aspects of care, not just sexual health and well-being. So before initiating PrEP, it's important to take a solid history. This allows the provider to determine eligibility, to take a sexual history, to discuss their last exposure. If it's within 72 hours, it should be a conversation about post-exposure prophylaxis versus pre-exposure prophylaxis, and assess for signs and symptoms of acute HIV infection. So pres 
integrating a sexual history into, into care is probably the most important thing. And it's something that can be really very, very simple. It helps us, it helps us as providers assess STI and HIV risk, it offers opportunities to discuss PrEP. And it's important, and I found this extremely important, to acknowledge my own beliefs and backgrounds and how they affected my views on sex and sexuality um, before I was able to take an accurate sexual history. And it allows the patient to be put at ease and be open so the patient's feel comfortable. This is just an example of a sexual history that um, font by the CDC. But for example, it, can, it doesn't have to be a complicated process. It can be integrated into the HPI. It's as simple as, are you sexually active? If yes, there can be follow-up questions about condom use, percentage of condom use, number of partners in the last six year or six months. But you all know your patient population, I think, the best. And you'll know how to kind of tailor a conversation on sexual history. But the important thing is to actually have a sexual history conversation. So what needs to be done before you can prescribe PrEP? There needs to be a negative HIV antibody test within one week of starting PrEP. Do not use the oral antibody test. Um, it needs to be a blood test. It can be a, a blood rapid test. In our clinic, we use the fourth generation HIV antigen antibody test. Um, we check for creatinine clearance. We prescribe if under 60, but only through conversations with renal providers and other providers. We screen for hepatitis B, offer vaccination if susceptible, and hepatitis C. Screen and test for STIs, and pregnancy test if applicable. There's only one medication that's FDA approved for PrEP, and that's Truvada, so it's very simple to remember how to do it. It's only approved for daily dosing. Prescribe no more than a 90-day supply, and refill after confirming patient remains HIV uninfected. So that means in our clinical practice, we have people come back every three months. We do HIV testing, we check their creatinine, we do FDI testing. The CDC recommends for our patient population that our MSM get tested every three months for STIs and HIV infections, so we just incorporate that into our PrEP plan. We talked about earlier that the most important part of PrEP efficacy is that patients are adherent. So from the beginning, it's really important to set and develop a PrEP adherence plan. Like I tell my patients, it only works if you take it. Um, studies shown that developing a pattern of adherence in the first few days, weeks, or months on PrEP allows for high continued adherence throughout the rest of the time that they're on it. The ways to do that is to tailor dosing time to correspond with regular schedule activities. Use reminders, technical devices. Um, make contingency plans as to address changes in routines or schedules. Identify friends or family who may be able to support their adherence. Um, for example, we talk to people if they brush their teeth every day. That might be a good time to take their medication. Um, if they frequently are gone for business trips or go to happy hour on Thursday and don't come back to their apartment until Sunday night, that it may be helpful to kind of plan ahead and put some pills in a little pill box and take it with them. The most important thing is just to meet people where they are and anticipate any issues that may come up. So follow-up on PrEP is also very simple. Um, you evaluate adherence at each visit. We see people about once every three months. At our clinic, we also incorporate a one-month um, post-starting PrEP just check-in to make sure there is no side effect issues, because those are going to happen in the first couple weeks if they're going to have any, and if they're not having any issues with adherence. We do an HIV antibody test every three months. We assess risk behaviors, provide counseling, condoms, test for STIs every six months regardless of symptoms. We do it every three months. We check uh, BUN and creatinine clearance three months after initiation and every six months. We routinely do it every three months um, just as, as they're getting blood work done as well. For women, we need to do a pregnancy test at each visit um, just to make sure that if anybody is pregnant that they're referred to someone with experience with this idea of preception. And then discontinuing PrEP. Um, like I said, it's there when you need it, and it's not there when you don't. There's many reasons that patients may discontinue PrEP. It can be a personal choice. They could have problems with non-adherence. They could have a lowered risk of HIV infect acquisition. For example, they change their life situation. They um, may have some side effects and want to stop and someone may become HIV positive. If people want to start PrEP, that's fine. Um, it's 
like I said, it's there when you need it and patients can stop at any time. Periods of sexuality and relationships are fluid and changing, and PrEP is a tool that's used as needed. But at times of discontinuation, PrEP should be continued for about 30 days after the last activity that could place someone at increased risk of HIV, treat like post-exposure prophylaxis. We don't know how long people need to take it after their last um, risk for exposure. Have an HIV test and have their HIV status documented. And check their kidney function and STIs. And then have a discuss discussion about other prevention tools that are open to them. And make sure that people know they can restart if PrEP is desired. I have patients that have come on and off PrEP at various points in the last three years. And what I tell people is that it's there when you need it, and, it's got, and it's, you can stop at any time. But if they do restart PrEP, they need to come back in for an HIV test. And then it will take another seven days to reach levels of protection. The other question I get a lot is, how do we pay for PrEP? Um, it's covered by Medicaid and most private insurance companies. For patients who are having difficulties um, or don't have insurance, there's a medication assistance program from Gilead. And they offer um, Chivada free of charge for people who have income, who have income levels below 500% of the federal poverty level and no other sources for health insurance or prescription covered. There's also a Gilead copay assistance program where they provide $300 a month towards the private insurance copays and deductibles. It does not cover individuals with Medicaid or Medicare, and there's no income requirement as part of that. We also use the Patient Assistance Network, which will cover up to $4,000 of um, copay assistance for individuals, which may help some people that fall on that, on that Tier 3 or Bronze Plan um, health insurance coverage. There are a multitude of PrEP resources out there. Um, the CDC has a great resource. Um, we use that for their provider supplement. There's Facebook pages such as PrEP Facts. There's the UCSF Clinician Consultation Center. There's a variety of places that are available. And I find that a lot of my clients are either extremely knowledgeable when they come in about PrEP or I are, have no, no awareness of it at all. So it's trying to increase awareness throughout all the population at risk. What is the future of PrEP? So the future of PrEP is trying to increase awareness, trying to get more information out there, trying to bridge education. So tools to help PrEP use in the real world, such as the decision support resources, um, PrEP-friendly providers. I know that a lot of jurisdictions are looking into those. Studies in older adolescents and children and, and ages 13 through 17, um, intermittent dosing, new medications, new formulations. For example, there's most likely going to be a new study of another medication similar to Truvada that may have less kidney toxicities. There's new delivery systems, um, vaginal rings. There's uh, injectable prep, potentially. So there will be many more options for people in the future. A couple key takeaway messages about PrEP. Using PrEP is a choice. It's not a lifelong commitment, and it's a good tool for people moving in and out of these seasons of risk. It's only one of many HIV prevention strategies. The more approaches used, the better the protection against HIV. Individuals must test HIV negative to initiate and continue on PrEP. The reason for that is that it is not a, a good, it, it's only part of an HIV treatment regimen. If someone is HIV positive, excuse me, HIV positive, they really need to have a more aggressive treatment regimen. Otherwise, we do lead the risk of having of developing resistance. Adherence is essential for effectiveness. The time to protection is longer for women. It may be about 20 days than men, which may be about seven days. And that's if women are involved in vaginal sex. And it takes about seven days to get um, protection for rectal coverage, regardless of whether PrEP is being initiated for the first time or restarted. Daily oral PrEP protects individuals from HIV when taken consistently. Patients and providers work together to develop strategies to maximize adherence. And the demonstration projects illustrate that this is a feasible addition to HIV prevention efforts. At Whitman Walker, we are a federally qualified health center that has a, a variety of options and variety of, of entrance into care. So for example, we do both post-exposure prophylaxis and HIV testing and counseling. And we have people come into our PrEP program through there. So PrEP somewhere where that touches every aspect of it. 
the STI treatment, we do a lot of that. We do a lot of PEP to PrEP transitions. So patients who come in for post-exposure prophylaxis are a great potential conversation and, and talk about taking daily PrEP to prevent a similar situation. And then we have incorporated it into our medical practice. Um, and our pharmacy on site has been helpful because they help with all of our copay assistance programs. And we utilize our, our adherence nurses to help with our adherence as well. So it's something that we've been able to incorporate into different levels of our community health center. Um, so before we got a little ahead of myself, so the next, what I'm, I just want to talk about kind of how we set things up at Whitman Walker. And then Justin, I'm going to introduce Justin Arnold, who will speak a little bit to how it was, what it was like to incorporate PrEP into his practice. So like I said, at Whitman Walker, we have about 350 patients on PrEP. We see them at the time of initiating PrEP. We have an HIV test. We, ha we get the fourth generation HIV test. Many times we have a rapid as well. And then we write a prescription for PrEP. We follow up with them within a, about a week later to make sure there was no issues in getting it filled. And we see them about a month later for an adherence check. And then we start following patients every three months. Um, every three months we discuss adherence. We ask if there's been any difficulty taking pills over the last seven days. And usually that will be able to give us a little more information on whether or not they're having problems dosing throughout the three month period of time. We trained all of our providers on prep and delivery, and our providers now use it as, as a, every three months to have a conversation about elevated blood pressure and other areas of health promotion and fitness. We did create a prep um, protocol that was based off of the CDC um, guidelines, and that has been used to train new providers over the last two years as new providers have come along. Justin Arnold was has been with us for the last four years, and he has been with us throughout the transmission, trans, the, the whole process. So he was seeing HIV positive individuals and HIV negative individuals in his primary care practice and then as working in the STI clinic. And he has now built a fairly large PrEP patient population. He has about 70 people on PrEP that he sees every three months. And we'll speak now a little bit about how he's incorporated PrEP into his practice. And here he is. Thanks, everyone. So I was asked to be on this call to provide an account of a provider who had no familiarity with PrEP uh, before and then has built a pretty large practice and feel very comfortable doing that. And so I started here with no exposure in my training right out of school in regards to PrEP and was asked to do that just because it was expected of all of us. Um, and so using the resources uh, that we had, we had this protocol at the time, which is essentially just the CDC PrEP guidelines, which is what I would recommend to you all uh, if you are by chance just starting your own PrEP practice. Uh, it's been very clear, very straightforward, um, with just a little bit of reading. I think it gives you all the information that you might need. Um, and since then um, have become very comfortable just uh, through the routine of prescribing it. Um, and in regards to uh, uh, sort of how I became more comfortable, I also had uh, a mentor in um, Megan. And I, I don't think that it's necessarily uh, an absolute that you have someone uh, because the guidelines are there, but it is very helpful to have someone that you can ask questions to. There are always going to be sort of atypical situations that come up, people starting and stopping PrEP, uh, concern for uh, acute HIV seroconversion. And while I understand that she's here with me in my same office, it's not necessary um, that that be the case, because usually they're just one-off questions that you could do over the phone. Um, and so in regards to like, if I had any tips for, uh, for you all who are maybe um, just beginning to uh, prescribe PrEP. Uh, I would say either I two patients, as Megan said, they're either folks that aren't at all familiar with PrEP or folks that are coming in asking about it and uh, are very familiar with it because of reading online or friends are on it. Um, and for those folks that come in asking for it, I would say that they know their sexual practices better than you do, regardless of what sort of history you take, even if they don't seem like they're a candidate, as long as you explain those risks which Megan went over, um, the uh, 
uh, effects of bone mineral density and kidney function, which you do monitor regularly in regards to the kidneys. Um, and just explain that to them, put that on the table. Even if they don't seem like they're at risk at all, maybe they're having trouble you know, admitting that they actually go to sex clubs or uh, whatever it might be. And then the other folks that I think are really important to uh, address are the folks that don't know about PrEP, who uh, maybe are coming in for STD checks a little bit more often. Even if it's negative, it's a conversation to at least put it out there and let them know that there's a medication that they can take uh, every day that is highly effective and has very few side effects. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Megan, uh, who can help answer any questions that you have. But again, I definitely encourage you to, if you're on the fence about prescribing PrEP, this is so I handle lots of primary care for HIV positive and negative individuals, and the PrEP patients are usually the easiest. So it's quite uh, quite nice to have them incorporated into your panel because they are usually uh, relatively healthy and they're accessing healthcare so regularly that they never come in with 10, 10 things they want to talk about. Um, and so really it has uh, been a very nice experience. I was a little hesitant to begin prescribing PrEP because I wasn't at all familiar with it, but um, it's very easy to get the hang of. And um, yeah, so on that point, here's Megan. Uh, before Megan begins, hello everyone, this is Carmelita again. I ask that you, if you have a question, either raise your hand or write it out in the chat area so that everyone who wants an opportunity can have an opportunity to ask a question. If we run out of time at the end, send your questions to me um, my information is on a contact sheet, the very last slide, and I'll make sure that both uh, Megan and Justin get your questions and I'll get those answers back to you. Um, also, the slide presentation, as well as this recording, will be available for download after the presentation. So, Megan? Hi, thank you all so much. Um, hopefully, and thanks, Justin, for being available, um, please feel free to ask any questions to myself or to Justin. Um, I think going through the slide deck, I realized that perhaps I may not have explained a little bit about acute HIV infection. So until there's any questions or if anybody has another hand raised, which I don't see, I can talk a little about that. Oh, and Robert Shore just offered that there was a Gilead copay program now allows for all 3,600 to be accessed at once, so the no more $300 a month limit, which is excellent because I know patients were having difficulties when they had a high drug deductible copay, so that's great. Um, so the, at each visit, we assess for, point, for HIV, acute HIV infection, and the usually is fatigue. Um, there can be a, a body rash, sore throat, um, lymphadenopathy and it's usually seen before someone is antibody positive. So it's really important in each visit to assess for signs of acute HIV infection. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, if uh, if you can think of anything later, my contact information is um, right here, either uh, Christian, Christian, Christopher, I'm sorry, or myself, um, and we'll get those questions again over to Whitman Walker. Oh, I see something just came in. So the question was that if there is a website people can go to to locate PrEP services in their area. And as far as I know, as, as far as I know, not necessarily. Um, it's very, it, it's by jurisdiction only. So I know that um, there's a site in San Francisco has a list. Um, there's a couple other jurisdictions that are putting the list together for PrEP providers. And the next question was, is the Whitman Walker protocol available even though it is similar to CDC? Um, I am happy to share that. I, 
first have to get permission from my internal um, supervisors because I think that they won't have a problem with it and I'm happy to share that with anybody. Are there any other questions at this time? Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation this afternoon. We would like to thank Megan and Justin for their time and their expertise. Again, if you have any further questions, feel free to contact Carmelita Whitfield or myself, Christopher Cannon, at the information on your screen. And with that, we'll say thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. So the questions didn't pop up. To no. So you have to. It's like I went to trade. The recording? Yes. yes, everything's off. So here's what you do grab the person's face. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Ah. So you grab the face. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. The person's face. Okay. Good to know. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and you just connect to your footage? Yes.